will be an opportune time to take them. It's okay. We've got a few minutes before the next one. Uh, and Zohan, if you're in the room, please step down. Are you Zohan Lehotsky, please step down. I, we're going to go, let me get through the schedule because you have the latest events you're showing up first. Uh, and then I think I will pick you up on that. Uh, right. So, if you want to Two, three. Okay. Everybody is hearing me. Okay. Just let me put the on here. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. As it seems that we have some issues with the other presenters, but that shouldn't be an issue because uh, now I would like to show you how to turn your software into hardware. I'm Zoltan Lehotsky. Uh, I'm free here from Hungary. Uh, actually with my colleague Almos, who is back there and will do the next talk. Uh, I will start with a simple question. Who is a software developer or a software guy here? Okay, so who is, who is some developer here is probably a software guy. Who is a hardware developer? Okay, we, we, we have a, a pretty good ratio, well, probably one to one, because usually there are not many hardware developers, and the reason is that hardware development is, well, as the name also suggests, hard. But the advantage of going bare metal uh, down to the chip design level or the logic hardware level is that you can get um, substantial performance increase and the power, for power uh, efficiency benefits. And this is exactly what allows Hestia you to do that but as a software developer. Because with Hesler, you write your code, you write your, well, .NET programs, actually, 
and Hessler will turn it into a piece of hardware like this one here. And again, the benefit is that it will be potentially faster and consume much less power. So let's see how it works. I will now go to Visual Studio because we are talking about .NET here, but don't be afraid, you can use not just C Sharp, but also Visual Basic, or even uh, Manage C++, or functional languages like F Sharp, or even scripting languages like PHP, JavaScript, or Python. Uh, by the way, the whole thing is up on, op on, on GitHub. Uh, I will show you the link later. Now, what we have here is an example called Parallel Algorithm. Uh, as the name suggests, well, this is a massively parallel uh, little piece of code here, because th that's where you get the benefit of going uh, onto the hardware level, if your application can be massively parallelized. Um, this example, uh, what it does is that it first takes an input number and then starts some tasks. Now, uh, is somebody familiar with the task parallel library in .NET here? Nobody. Good, uh, because then I can tell you anything. But uh, honestly, what they are about is that tasks are, basically, tasks are basically an abstraction over threads. So when you are starting a task here, then eventually the task scheduler will select a thread from the .NET thread pool and run as many such threads in parallel uh, as many the platform allows. Now this laptop I have here has um, two physical cores uh, in, this, in this i5 CPU and four logical cores. So the hardware level parallel we get here is, well, around four. But we are actually starting 280 tasks. Now these 280 tasks will still run on these four cores here. But when we convert the whole thing into hardware, then on the hardware, so on this device here, we will get a hardware level parallelism of 280. Here, 280 physical little processing cores will work all in parallel. Now, what we are actually doing here, or computing in this sample here, uh, in parallel is pretty simple. Uh, there is a bit of conditional logic here, uh, nothing fancy, but it is executed 10 million times. And then the result is returned back. And again, the whole code and many more samples are up on GitHub. You can check it out later. Then we wait for all of these tasks to finish. And once that happens, uh, we sum these outputs together, and that will be the output of the whole application. Now I will run, uh, run this. This is part of a small console application. Uh, what will happen is that Hessler in the background is converting the whole thing into hardware. And uh, we'll eventually start communicating with this device here. It will execute this uh, piece of code three times. And um, next, it will also execute it on the CPUs on my laptop here. So let's, say, let's see what the results are. And here we have the results. Um, it took uh, roughly 300 milliseconds all three times on the hardware uh, to execute this parallel algorithm sample. Actually, if you take a closer look, it's exactly the same amount of time, down to the 10 millions, uh, 10 thousandths milliseconds. And the reason is that with the hardware, you, get, you basically get an application-specific coprocessor for your application. And the execution time is also deterministic. There is no printing system, no noisy neighbors, nothing else. Now, on the CPU, it took around five seconds to uh, an order of magnitude more than on the CPU. Now, of course, this is not a very scientific example, not a very scientific measurement, but still, this should give you an idea of what's possible with Hessier and with uh, hardware conversion like this. So uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, this was from me in five minutes. Uh, I will be here for the rest of the day. Uh, let's talk if you have something cool for Hessler. That's awesome. Thank you for finishing on time. Um, as we are more or less discarding the timetable completely, uh, can any lightning talk speakers who are in the room, are you, are you here for lightning talks to give one? No? Blink? OK. Uh, well, you're next anyway, so come down. Um, <laughs> you know, just to consider. Wait, it's, you know. <laughs> Given that we have a little bit of wheel room, any questions for Hasley at this moment? It's unusual, but we've lost half our speakers. So. Okay. <laughs> I love the idea of simplifying FPGA development. That's, that's a big deal. Okay, next up. So, hello, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Amos Sabo, and I would like to talk about uh, 
a new number format called POSITS, and it is uh, proposed by Dr. John Gustafsson to become uh, a better version, an improved version of uh, existing IEEE flow, uh, floating point standards, and we have implemented it in uh, .NET C Sharp, and we have also, also transformed it to a hardware logic uh, with test layer. So, uh, about IEEE floats, uh, you probably know that uh, they are basically everywhere, that's why they are, <laughs> that's because they are actually uh, standard. Uh, so whenever you use uh, a floating point type on your uh, computer, that, that's uh, probably an actually float. And so what's the problem with them? Why do we need posits instead of them? Because uh, first of all, they are wasteful. Uh, for example, in a 32-bit uh, IEEE float, there are over 60 million bit patterns that only say not a number. So uh, you don't assign the real value to those patterns, and, uh, and that's just a waste. Uh, they are also slower than they could be because uh, the, the smallest uh, numbers are represented in a different way. Uh, they are called subnormals, and uh, we need uh, different logic for that. So it, it, uh, it makes uh, algebraic computation slower than they need to be, and also the, the chips are bigger than they need to be. And uh, they are not, not uh, distributed really well because, for example, in, in a 32-bit IEEE float, there are uh, uh, eight exponent bits always, uh, whether uh, you need them or not, because small uh, magnitude numbers wouldn't really need eight bits of exponent. So, well, this could be better because uh, there are only one M value in there, so all the others are uh, assigned to uh, real numbers. All these are handled the same way, so there are no, no uh, subnormals, and uh, they are handled exponent bits differently. So there are more values distributed around one, and less uh, very large or very small magnitude values. So that could result in our computations that are scaled, probably th they could be more accurate. So now I would like to show of how it works. So I show it in Visual Studio. Uh, this is the method we are going to run both uh, on the CPU and on hardware. I'm going to start it now because it's going to take some time. explain what's happening. So we just read a number from the memory, uh, create a posit out of it with the value of 1, uh, copy it into a variable b, and uh, in a for loop uh, for 100,000 times, because that's the number we will read from the memory, we will uh, uh, add this number to the number a. So basically we will just count up to 100,000 to demonstrate how uh, posits work. And uh, then we convert our result back to an integer by a simple cast and uh, put it in the result variable and we write it back to the memory. So let's see how our, our regeneration is going. Our sample has already run on the CPU. It took about 159 milliseconds. And now we are waiting a bit for the hardware generation to happen. runs on the FPGA board as uh, a hardware logic. So it has happened. And uh, it took about 211 milliseconds on uh, <laughs> so that's how it works. And uh, well, uh, okay. So you can uh, learn more about Tesla and the deposit number format on the links above, and find us on the email address and. 
even even for Syria, if you for Syria, if you want to talk more about this. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I think, uh, firstly, any of the other scheduled lightning speakers in the room? No tickers? Fine. Uh, ben? Just bought? Yeah. take HDMI, but for my presentation, I'll need a stereo microphone and a grand piano. We might, uh, <laughs> might arrange those for tomorrow. Okay. Uh, okay, is this thing going to go out there? Let's see. There it is. Oh, crap. All right, here we go. Okay, so this is just a quick uh, informational thing. If you all heard about the DAO hack, I'm just going to tell you how that came to be. But a little bit of background. Uh, this is an interesting tweet that I saw recently. Uh, you know, real scientists uh, often, you know, deal with real issues and have real ramifications, right? They have, they have consequences. And they make, often make the observation that computer programmers don't deal with consequences. They haven't really had to live with that. And I believe that's because any science that has the word well, any, any subject matter that has the word science in it is not a real science, right? Chemistry and physics are real science. Political science, not a science. Computer science, we're, we're not a science. We have not dealt with real, with real uh, um, ramifications, right? So we don't have any skin in the game. We've got some very serious ethical issues. And now that we're talking about building our economy on this uh, crypto ledger stuff and this blockchain stuff, you know, we've got we to gotta really get it together. So uh, one year after the ERC-20 was really standard came the DAO. And on July 17, 2017, we encountered real consequences. All right? Existential consequences worth over $50 million and the destruction of a $150 million organization. So, uh, yeah. So this is not this is not for people to. Uh, uh, yeah, this, this, it's 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 not good. You know, like if you're if you're writing JavaScript code for the next Facebook killer and edge conditions cause your program to break, you can reload the browser, right? But if three lines of code causes your organization to be expelled, then maybe you're picking the wrong platform upon to which to build your future. Right? So I call this Dykster's Revenge. So how do we get here? Uh, da -da 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 -da. Okay, where's my code? Okay, here we are. So. Uh, real briefly, and now this, this uh, link has, I think, the best analysis of the DAO exploit, but this is the actual code that is the problem. So um, there's a function called split DAO. So what the DAO is, is you, you, you invest in a, in, in a project, and if you want to get your money back out of the project, you say, I want to get out of it, you call this split DAO function in the contract, and it computes, oops, it computes, uh, up here at the beginning is just figuring out how much money you are owed, okay? And the very next thing it does is it calls this withdrawal reward for to the, to the messenger, calls a function on that messenger's contract which actually sends him the money that he's owed, okay? Now, after that, the code updates the local balances of how much money the DAO has left, right? and uh, up, you know, update your ledger and all that kind of stuff. Except the problem is, is that this withdrawal reward for makes a function call to the guy's contract and taking advantage of some of the nasty behavior of Solidity, which is an awful language for writing contracts that need to be secure, um, it allowed them to recursively call the function. And so instead of continuing down and updating the balances, it jumps back up to here. And then comes back down to the part where it sends the guy money and jumps back up to there and comes back down to the part where it sends the guy money until it runs out of gas and the contract can't execute anymore. And so that's how all the money got taken away. Now, had they moved that line, the, uh, the withdrawal reward for function, underneath these two lines of code, it wouldn't have happened. That's the whole thing. 150 million bucks. Right? So what's, what's the issue here? Right? We've got imperative programming model logic with magic object model behavior, completely non-obvious, and we're dealing with billions of dollars of value on top of it. Right? No atomic paired operations. 
It's a freaking ledger. Does anybody know what the word ledger means? How do you not, how do you update one side without the other one, right? What should happen is if any part of the transaction fails, the whole thing should get rolled back. So it should have recursively functioned, called, did its nasty bit, realized that the thing hasn't been updated correctly, undid the whole thing, right? That's the way a proper uh, ledger works, right? So, you know, in this day and age, what could possibly inspire such obviously defective models? No, JavaScript and Golang programmers. So that's my punchline. Ta -dum. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> nice finish. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Right. Uh, have any of the other scheduled speakers materialized? Lightning, lightning, lightning. There is no lightning. Hello. I want to talk about how Bunny broke his leg. <laughs> Does Bunny want to talk about his leg? <laughs> you you got to come up with a better story than that, man. This has got to be hardware related or something. I slipped and fell <laughs> while soldering an FPGA. Hello everyone, I'm Fatima Rafiki and today I'll be talking about uh, metric visualization in Grafana. So I was working on Grafana while I was in Oracle uh, to visualize various uh, virtual machine data, uh, data of various virtual machines. So first let's understand why it is important to visualize data. It is often said that data is the new fuel. It helps us visualize, analyze and discover new patterns, strategies and which help us in taking important and crucial decisions after we visualize our data better. Therefore, it is often said that data is the new soil or the new oil. There is an example which shows that uh, why data visualization is important. Uh, we have a plot which is against an average artist revenue pay with respect to along with uh, the total user base you may see that uh, the you although youtube has the lowest pay it has the largest user base so it would be better if the artist like the artist would be more likely to choose youtube although it has the least pay but because of his uh, because of the largest uh, user base uh, there there are chances that the artist will earn the highest revenue there comes uh, Grafana in picture. There are a lot of tools that uh, can help uh, you visualize data, but since this is an open source conference, I would say that um, I have some experience in Grafana, so I would like to share that with you. Grafana works almost uh, equally well with all of the database, but uh, it is often said that a time series database works a lot better with Grafana because with each record you have a timestamp associated with it. So uh, the most commonly used databases are in FluxDB and Graphite. They are both open source and uh, very easy to use. And the syntax of e in FluxDB is almost similar to that of MySQL. So MySQL developers will not have any issues while uh, working in within FluxDB. This is a snapshot while I was working. This is one of the snapshots which shows the CPU utilization of uh, the CPU utilization with respect to the timestamp and uh, you can see that uh, uh, it is for one particular host. Now that we have discussed uh, that, uh, now that we have uh, discussed the database population, uh, we have to add that uh, data as a data source in the Grafana dashboard. The procedure, these are all the data sources that have added. The procedure uh, to add a data source is uh, quite easy. There's a simple form which where you have to fill all the name, type and uh, URL of the database. The type includes the database that you're using in, Flux, in, in FluxDB, Graphite, 
uh, or uh, MySQL, whatever you are using, then you fill uh, the database details, the database name that you used in FluxDB, Augurified, and uh, ju you just save and test, and that that's your done. That's done. And the data source is added. What next? The data source is added. How do you plot the graph? You just add one graph in the Grafana, like there's an option to add a graph, and there you can add a query. The query is the, exactly the same that you used in MySQL. Uh, it is that select this field from uh, uh, that, uh, that database and group it by time interval or whatever reference you want to group it by and the graph, graph is plotted. So these are uh, one of the few graphs that I plotted during that time. The first one is the deployment bills of the queue count, like uh, the, queue, the bills that are currently queued. Uh, and the second one is the deployment bills that are currently running on all the virtual machines al uh, along with their uh, respective time stamp on the uh, x-axis. So this opens a wide sea of possibilities for uh, data visualization. There are a lot of tools, other tools present, but Grafana makes it really easy and simple to use. And you can plot any type of data, not only simple uh, graphs, you can plot uh, pie charts, box plots, histograms, pie charts, any, any of the plots that you want. And uh, uh, eventually you can like visualize your data better and more efficiently and make more strategic decisions which can help you gain more insights on your data and make full optimum uh, utilization of that. Uh, if you want to uh, discuss more about it. I'll be walking around through the conference and we can discuss more. Or you can just ping me on my handle. Thank you. Very impressive. The audience can't see it. She finished as the thing went zero zero. <laughs> much, much appreciated. Uh, I suspect we're going to have a few minutes break unless any of the lightning scheduled speakers have turned up. Nope. Some silence. All right. In that case, uh, we resume in about seven minutes' time, hopefully with Forston. Thank you.